Hello. Today we look at an interesting aspect of two of Paul's prison epistles, the book of Colossians and the book of Ephesians. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians and the Colossians are what we call twin epistles. They were both written by Paul around the same time, possibly 60 to 61 AD, and uh, both of them are regarded as prison epistles, meaning that they were both written by Paul from prison. These epistles were written to the churches at two different places, Ephesus and Colossae. And uh, here is a map showing the location of Ephesus and Colossae in relation to each other. As to the features of both these epistles, if we were to place their materials side by side, we would notice that they are similar. And in some places, the words that are used in both these epistles are the same. Let's start by taking note of uh, this very odd verse in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16. As Paul concludes his letter to the church at Colossae, he says this, After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. I want you to look at the words, the letter from Laodicea. We are familiar with the epistles of Paul. He wrote a number of letters to churches at different cities, but Paul talks about a letter from Laodicea or a Laodicean epistle. If you were to search the New Testament, you will not find an epistle to the Laodiceans. So what was Paul talking about? If you look at this verse, it appears that Paul understood that the letter that he wrote to the Laodiceans was quite well known, so that when he mentioned to the Colossian church that you should also read the letter from the Laodiceans, he expected them to know what he was talking about. There is a letter to the Laodiceans and is found in Revelation chapter 3 where the Holy Spirit instructed John to write letters to seven churches and the church at Laodicea was one of them. However, this letter to the Laodicean church was to be written 30 years later in AD 90. The understanding of Bible scholars is this. Paul wrote a circular letter. He wrote a letter which was to be taken to one church, to be read out to that church for maybe one week or two weeks or a few weeks. And after that, it would be taken to another church in another city to be read. And after that, it would be taken to another city to be read in the church in that city. The letter that Paul wrote was to be sent first to the church at Laodicea. The question is, why Laodicea? Paul had a close relationship with the church at Laodicea. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 15, where Paul says, Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in the house. Paul knew the members of the church at Laodicea personally. Paul also seems to be aware of some problem that they were going through and he was praying for them. He says this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. Paul probably knew about the situation at Laodicea through Epaphras, 
who came to visit Paul in prison and he must have told Paul about what was going on in Laodicea. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, we read this. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, matured and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. So a letter was written by Paul and sent to the church at Laodicea. After it was read at the church at Laodicea, it was then taken to the churches in other cities to be read. Here is a map of the places that this letter traveled to. You would notice that if the letter was first sent to Laodicea, the next place that it would be sent to would be Philadelphia, and then on to Sardis, to Thyatira, then on to Pergamon, and then it will come down to the city of Smyrna, and finally ending up at the city of Ephesus. If you look at the names of these places, these are the same churches that are referred to in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, what is known as the seven churches in Revelation. Eventually, the letter ends up at Ephesus, where it was kept, and over time, it was known as the Epistle to the Ephesians. It is interesting to note that in some of the earliest manuscripts of the book of Ephesians, the name of the church is not found in the opening verses. In my Bible, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 reads as follows, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. In my Bible, there is a note on top of the word Ephesus, and this note tells us that some early manuscripts do not have the, word, the words in Ephesus. In other words, when Paul wrote this letter, in chapter 1 verse 1, he would write it as follows, to God's holy people and then there would be a blank space, followed by the words, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So when this letter was taken to the church at Laodicea, when that person reads verse 1, he would say to God's holy people in Laodicea. Later, when it was taken to Philadelphia to be read, the reader would read verse 1 to God's holy people in Philadelphia. So that was how Paul was able to write one letter with useful instructions and teachings and be able to teach a number of churches. His letter would be taken from one city to another to be read to the various congregations and eventually it would end up at Ephesus. Later, Paul learns about a doctrinal problem in the Colossian church and he writes the letter to the Colossian church. In addition to addressing this problem in Colossians chapter 2, Paul also repeated some of the material that he wrote in the epistle to the Laodicean or the Ephesian churches. However, his treatment of these subjects in his letter to the Colossians was not as extensive or detailed as that found in the letter to the other churches. And so in Colossians chapter 4 verse 16, which we read earlier, Paul advises the Colossian church to also read the other letter so that they can get a full picture of his teaching about the Christian life. So therefore, from what we can see, both these epistles were written by Paul to various churches containing similar material. And uh, that is why we call them twin epistles. Why am I telling you this? Knowing the background of biblical books help us in interpreting 
passages in the book. Today, we want to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where Paul instructs the believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The importance of this verse is that it describes the principle and power for living the Christian life. At the same time, this verse is mysterious in the sense that it can be difficult to understand. So it is the subject of many interpretations over the years. One of the most popular interpretation of this verse gives the idea that you can do something or undergo a certain experience and you get instant power. You are filled with the Holy Spirit and immediately that power is available to you to do great things in the Christian life. So what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? How do we understand this verse? Firstly, we look at the definition of the word filled. In Thayer's lexicon, the word filled is described as what wholly takes possession of the mind is said to fill it. The primary idea in this definition is that of possession or control. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 itself, there is an idea of control that is found in this verse. Paul says, do not get drunk on wine. When a person is drunk on wine, who controls him? It is a wine that controls him. If he's not drunk, he is in full control of his faculties, his thoughts, his actions, his behavior. But when he is drunk, he is no longer in control of himself. It is the wine that is in control of himself and he says things or do things that he would not normally do if he was not drunk. So Paul makes a comparison here. Instead of being controlled by wine, you should be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at other passages to see how the word fill is used. In Acts chapter 15, Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. And in the next verse, we read that they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. The high priest, his fellow priests, and the Sadducees were jealous at the success of the apostles in their preaching and attracting people to the gospel. When this verse says that they were filled with jealousy, it means that they were controlled by the emotion of jealousy. And it was this emotion that then dictated what they would do. Because they were controlled by jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in jail. These enemies of the gospel were controlled by that negative emotion of jealousy, which then dictated what they would do. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We are to let the Holy Spirit control our whole personality in our daily lives. What does filling mean in practical terms? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 is the twin of Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Instead of saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit, as in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let me suggest to you that these two verses are like two sides of the same coin. They are saying the same thing, but with different words. To show you what I mean, look at the instructions that follow these verses in both the epistles. Both verses are followed by the same set of instructions. 
Therefore, to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, means to let the Word of Christ dwell richly in us, as found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. The key to a Spirit-controlled life is to saturate our lives with the Word of God. Look at the word dwell in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word dwell means to live or to reside in some place permanently. So to let the word of Christ dwell in our lives is to give the word of God a permanent and important place in our lives. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 also used the word Richly, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Richly, to let the word of Christ dwell in our life richly, in a practical sense, means that we should have a hunger and desire for the word of God. To the extent that we read the word of God and we study the word of God and we want to fill our lives with the word of God. Not just reading a verse a day, but trying to devour as much of the Bible as we can each time we open it. That is the meaning of the word richly. Not to just do a seven-minute quiet time or devotional, but to do a two-hour Bible study each day if you can. This is what it means by the word richly. We do not want to take in the Word of God in bits and pieces at long intervals, but we want to absorb as much as we can. We want to fill our lives with the Word of God so that every part of our personality, our mind, our lives is filled with the Word of God. Is that something that we can do? That is what God wants us to do. Another key to the spirit control life is to submit to the Word of God. Our minds, wills, and emotions must be made subject to the teachings of God's Word. And where necessary, changes or sacrifices must be made to bring all areas of our lives into conformity with the Word of God. What are the results of being filled with the Holy Spirit? A filled life is a changed life. There are two practical effects that should result from how being filled with the Holy Spirit. Firstly, there should be a change in our relationship with others. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, this was what Paul said, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. This refers to us relating to our fellow believers in terms of encouraging them, giving them comfort, and also giving them admonition and edification. We should speak in a positive and constructive way to each other. We should not speak in a destructive manner. What we say should be seasoned with salt and our words should be a balm for the soul of others. Secondly, it should also result in a change in our relationship with God. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, it reads, Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfulness is an evidence of submission to God's will. And it enables the believer to see divine love and blessings even in times of adversity. I know it is easy to give thanks to God when everything is going well, when we are healthy, when we have no problems, when we have all that we need. But when all these things are taken away, when we go through difficult times, through times of adversity, when we suffer, can we give thanks to God? A life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit is able to give thanks to God 
it is able to encourage others all the time. And it is able to give thanks to God, whatever the circumstances. That is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is a lifelong task for us to cultivate this in our Christian life. And it is a daily challenge for us to let the Holy Spirit control us in every area of our lives, in our thoughts, our words, our deeds, our actions, our decisions, in our relationship with others, in how we relate to God. When we are filled with the Spirit that is controlled by the Spirit, when the Word of God dwells in our life richly and we submit to the will of God, we will be able to do the will of the Father just as our Lord Jesus did. Thank you for tuning in. Have a nice day.